Look here in Genesis chapter three and verse one. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And I have meditated on these verses literally tens of thousands of hours. I could, I have already preached hours on nearly every word in this. So I'm going through and just hitting some of the highlights. But notice that the serpent was the most subtle animal. That means the most sly, cunning, crafty, deceptive animal that God had created. Why did God, why did Satan choose the serpent? Why didn't he choose a elephant to just put his foot on her head and say, go eat of the fruit or I'll smush you like a melon. <laughs> Why didn't he use an, a lion or some animal to intimidate them with fear? It's because he had no power to make them do anything. He was the anointed cherub that covered Isaiah chapter 14. And he was there to minister to the people of God, not to... Man, I've got a great teaching on this. I haven't got time to go into that. So I'm going to pull a Dwayne and say, don't go there, Andrew. <laughs> Get my teaching on uh, the true nature of God. It'll really bless you. But the reason he chose this animal is because he had no power to force them to do anything. His only power is lies and deception. He is the father of all lies. Every lie that has ever been spoken was because that person had intercourse with the devil. The devil is the one that birthed that lie. You need to remember that anytime you go to stretching the truth, that you're flirting with the devil. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not bear false witness. It didn't say you shall not lie. Of course, lying is bearing false witness, but false witness, you could be saying the truth and yet not present the truth. You could be just sharing certain information. Uh, man, I don't wanna go there. I could give you some great examples of things that have happened this week by our president and by people that they are saying some things that it may be partially factual, but they're taking it out of context. It's false witness. And it was the devil that birthed that in them. It's lies. Satan doesn't have the power to force you to do anything. He can't do anything to us without our consent and cooperation. This is why you know the truth and the truth makes you free because the moment you understand the truth, deception is gone. You know, Congressman Bob McEwen made this point and I thought it was just a great illustration. But if you were to guess how wide this stage is. I can tell you exactly how wide this stage is because I designed it. And I can tell you exactly how many feet it is. But you know, if I was to start asking you, some people would say 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. We'd have all kinds of different things and what makes one opinion better than the other. You could sit there and argue over it and talk about it and say, no, I, I really believe it's 60 feet or whatever. All you have to do is get a tape measure and measure it. And once the facts are known, it just automatically invalidates all of the lies, all of the guesses. And you know what? Today, people are doing away with the standard, the truth, the accuracy. And they're thinking, well, I believe that it's up to the person to choose whether they're a male or a female. I believe that, you know, we can do this and that. And they just have these opinions. And the reason they hate the word of God, the reason they are trying to get it out of the schools and they're trying to make all Christians withdraw into their four walls of their facility and get out of the public square. And you have no right. We had a congressman a month ago and, and somebody stood up and quoted the Bible and he interrupted them and says, the Bible has no place in this Congress. That is blasphemy. This nation was founded on the truths of the Bible. And our forefathers says that democracy was, is totally unfit for anybody but a moral people. If America ceases to be more moral, we will destroy ourselves. And there were many comparisons between the French Revolution that was ant, uh, ag agnostic or, or anti-God versus the American Revolution that was birthed on freedom based on scripture and God giving us these freedoms. And the 
French Revolution just killed hundreds of thousands of people in bloodbath. There was one area that they killed over 100,000 people and beheaded them. The guy who came up with the guillotine, his name was something like guillotine. It was, it was some kind of uh, variation of his name. He was beheaded on his own guillotine. And there was people killed by the, by the thousands. It was because they didn't have God in it. And, and our society today is trying to remove God and remove absolute truth and say everything is relative because they, the devil doesn't have power to force anything upon us. He's got to get us away from the truth. The moment the truth is known, deception loses its power. That's why the truth that we know sets us free. So Satan didn't come and try and force them, intimidate them. What he did was come and deceive them and look at how he did it. The very first thing he said unto the woman, man, I could spend some time on this, but I believe that the reason he came to the woman and it says down here in the sixth and the seventh verse that she gave to her husband who was with her. Adam was with her. He was there. So it's not like the woman was tempted without Adam. Adam and Eve were both there. But the reason he came to the woman and said this to the woman is because over in chapter two, verse 17, God told Adam, don't eat of this tree before Eve was taken out of his side. Eve didn't hear these words. Adam is the one that heard these words. And so therefore Satan came to the woman because it was secondhand information to her. And here is a great truth that the word of God has to become real to you. This is where so many people miss it. They go to a church, they hear pastor Dwayne, pastor rich, somebody else. And they are, they're, they're just convinced that what they're saying is right, but you're living off of another person's revelation. And it makes you susceptible to doubt in a way that a person who has had a revelation themselves uh, isn't susceptible. Adam had God speak to him directly and say, in the day that you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. He didn't say you might die. It is a possibility. He says you will die. It was a guarantee. But he told Eve about it. And therefore Eve, it wasn't her revelation. She was living off of her husband's revelation. You have to receive the revelation for yourself. You know, I minister to a lot of people and we have a lot of people come through here and we have a lot of people that receive the things that we say and it becomes revelation to them and it changes them. But then there's other people sitting right next to them who will hear the exact same words and it doesn't set them free. When I first got into ministry, I thought that if I just presented things properly, everybody would be transformed. And yet I began to see one person would be totally set free and then the next person would fall asleep. And then the one on the other side, like uh, Carrie did today <laughs> during a meeting, I heard about this. And, uh, and then one would fall asleep and then the one on the other side would be just totally set free. And I thought there's no way that the words coming out of my mouth could affect people differently like that. It's not my words that are different. It's the condition of their heart. Some people receive it, other people don't. So anyway, you have to make the word first person for you. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, I used to go, I was still in the Baptist church and I used to go hear Kenneth Copeland. Once a month, he would hold a, a three-day meeting over at Will Rogers Auditorium in Fort Worth and we'd drive about an hour and a half and go hear him. And... Um, I would just get fired up, man. I'd hear these things and I'd go back to my Baptist church and preach and we would see miracles happen. People would be set free. Healings would happen. It would be awesome for the first week, maybe two weeks, but then the third week it would start waning. And by four weeks, I was just saying words and people, it was making no impact on them. And the reason is because I was being criticized. The leaders of the church had come and say, you're preaching heresy. You, and I just couldn't stand against the criticism and against the persecution. And so I'd go back and hear him the next month and I'd come fired up. And this happened for like a year or more. And I would see this pattern so much so that I even began to expect it. 
I expected that after two weeks, it just wasn't going to have the same impact and I needed to go get another fix. And I was praying, saying, God, what's wrong? And I heard Kenneth Copeland teach on Mark chapter four about the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And the second type of person that heard the word, they received it with gladness. They were excited about it. That was me, but they had no root in themselves. And so endured only for a while and Satan was able to steal it away. And I remember that was a Saturday night. Jamie and I were studying and we heard that and we made a decision and said, never again will I have to quote and say, well, Kenneth Copeland said, or Kenneth Hagin or whoever said, I said, it's going to become my revelation. And if you've listened to me, I don't quote other people a lot. And it's not because I don't receive from other people and don't appreciate what they say. But if I hear somebody say something, I'm going to make it mine. And by the time I get through meditating on it, I forgot who said what. I don't care who I heard it from. It was God that spoke it to me. And so I'll stand up and say what God spoke to me. A lot of people don't personalize the word like that. This is the reason Satan came to the woman and tempted her was because he knew she was more susceptible to doubt because she got it secondhand and it wasn't personal revelation to her. So he came to the woman and he said, hath God said, he challenged the word of God. They could not have sinned. They could not have gotten into disobedience if they would have just stuck with what God said. We were singing this song tonight. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's done. That's the way that we ought to be. And I'm saying this in love, but brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people right here in this auditorium that God said it, you've heard it, but that doesn't settle it. There's a lot of people that honestly aren't absolutely committed to the truth of God's word. And God will tell you something. For instance, we've been encouraging you this whole time to come to Karis Bible College if God is speaking to you. And it just amazes me that people will say, oh yeah, God told me to come, but, and then they'll tell me the problems that they're having, but I've got to sell my house, but am I going to be able to find a job, but it's more expensive to live here than it is where I came from. And they just start listing all of the obstacles that stand in their way. I think I said this in the afternoon session, so not all of you heard this, but we actually had a guy who came and told me that God, he said, I know it beyond a doubt that God told me to come to Karis Bible College, but his family had not heard of me. So they went and asked their pastor, who is this guy? And he said, oh, they're a cult. Stay away from them. So his parents said, don't go. And they said, if you do go, we're going to disinherit you from the family business and you stand to lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he had a uh, fiance that they were engaged to be married and she didn't want anything to do with them coming to Colorado and attending school. And she says, I'll break off the engagement if you go. So he was going to lose money. He was going to lose his family. He was going to lose his inheritance. He was going to lose his fiance. And he just started giving me a list of all of the reasons. And after 20 minutes or so, he says, so what do you think? And I said, you lost me the moment you said God told you. If God told you, I believe it. That settles it. Do it. Do it if it hair lips the devil. Do it if it costs you everything you've got. And see, there's a lot of people that, wait a minute. I know God said this, but I'm not sure that I'm going to obey God. I just can't even relate to that. I'm not saying I do everything perfectly, but man, March the 23rd, 1968, I gave up control of my life. And I've done things. God told me to quit secular school that I was in. I lost $350 a month from the government. I lost the acceptance of my family. I got criticized. I got kicked out of church and I got an all expense paid trip to Vietnam <laughs> by doing that. And there was a lot of things. It could have been life and death, but it didn't matter to me. I knew that that's what God told me to do. And I was willing to go to Vietnam and die if that's what God wanted. Amen. There is so much freedom in you not being in control of your life and just saying, Father, what do you want me to do? And if he says, go do this, you just do it. We try and rationalize it. Do you know, Abraham 
was told by God to leave his father's house and all of his kindred and leave Earl of the Chaldees and come into the land that God had promised him. He didn't obey immediately. He stayed in Haran for, I don't know, an undetermined period of time. And only after his father died did he come into the promised land. And then he still brought Lot, his nephew, with him. And his brother had died, and I believe that he was probably trying to be a good uncle to Lot and thinking about that this guy's fatherless, and so I'm going to help him. And he, he probably had good intentions, but God told him to leave them. And he could have rationalized it and said, but what's going to happen to my nephew if I'm not there to help him? And he needs a father figure. And so he just, for whatever reason, did not obey God and brought Lot with him. Let me ask you how it could have been any worse for Lot if he would have left him in Ur of the Chaldees than what happened to Lot. For those of you who don't know, Lot went into Sodom and Gomorrah and he wound up losing at least two daughters because it says he went out to his daughters that lived in the city and tried to get them to come and they felt like he was mocking and they didn't do it. And so he had at least two daughters plus sons-in-law. He could have had grandkids. We don't know, but at least two daughters that were in Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed in the destruction of it. His wife turned around and looked behind her because she was attached to the daughters, the family, the things in Sodom and Gomorrah, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. And then... His two daughters that came out with him thought that every man on the earth had been killed and they said, we're going to uh, all die. We've got to have children. They weren't married and so they got their dad drunk and had sex with him and he had two children by incest. How could it have been any worse if Abraham would have just obeyed God and done what he said? And there's people that say, but I've got a, a parent. Well, who's going to take care of them? Did God tell you to do it? That's the key. Did God say to you, if God said it, just salute and say, yes, sir. You might ask, how do I do it? When do I do it? But not, am I going to do it? If God tells you to do something, you just do it. Well, it could kill me. I could be drafted and sent to Vietnam if I do what God told me. You just do it. And you know what? It turned out Vietnam is one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. I was a Baptist when I went to Vietnam. And when I came out, I wasn't. And I didn't mean to change. I didn't try and change. I just spent 10 to 15 hours a day studying the Word. And when I came back, the Baptist didn't want me. So anyway, you got to make the Word personal. And when God says something to you, you just do it. Eve should have said, look, yes, God said don't eat of this tree. End of discussion. I'm going to quit talking to you, snake. She let a talking snake talk her into doubting what God said. She could not have sinned if she would have just said, look, God said it. And that's the end of this discussion. First of all, many Christians don't even know what God's word said. You know, I mentioned this this morning, but this whole woke culture where they're tearing down statues and wanting to redo history, there are at least five different times in the word that we are commanded not to remove a landmark. It's a command. You are in sin if you go to tearing down landmarks. Most Christians don't even know that. And so they just watch what's happening and think, well, maybe that's what we should do. If you knew what the truth said, you wouldn't do it. Even if it's bad history, you can learn from it. But most people don't know what the word says. Most people don't understand the principles that are given. Most people don't know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so they're tolerating homosexuality. Homosexuality, according to Romans chapter one, is the last stop on the train to being reprobate. Amen. You got to get off there. If you go into homosexuality, the next thing is being absolute reprobate to where there is no more any conviction, no more any conscience of sin. That's what the word says. And yet most Christians don't know that. And they think, well, you know, we'll just tolerate this. It's ungodly. You need to love the people. 
I love people. I've had people on staff who've struggled with homosexuality and did some things. And I told them, look, I love you. I'll give you another chance. But if you're going to live this way, you are not going to be an employee. And you know what? They straightened up and they've been an employee with me for over a decade. And so I'm not against people that have struggled with things, but it is wrong. And we've got to stand up. And yet there's a lot of Christians that don't know the word. They don't know what it says. I'm telling you, you've got to know the word. Satan cannot get you into any failure without believing a lie. I'm not sure I'll be able to connect the dots and convince you of this, but you can't get sick without believing a lie. And some of you think, now that's not true. I don't, I didn't do anything to get sick. It just came upon me. That's not true. If you believe the truth, man, I could give you hundreds of scriptures right now that promise you no plague will come nigh your dwelling. Only with your eyes you shall see the reward of the wicked. Exodus chapter 23, I believe it's verse 25, 24 or 25. It says, you shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and water and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. The word take and away is the Hebrew word that means to turn off. I will turn off sickness on the inside of you. Deuteronomy chapter seven, where we just read Deuteronomy chapter eight during the offering, it says that no plague no sickness will come upon you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says that every sickness and every disease which is not written here, you are redeemed from those. If you knew the truth of the word of God, then you wouldn't submit to this sickness. But a lot of people think, but I'm only human and cancer is incurable. It's only incurable if you believe what men say. God says all sickness all disease. There is nothing that will ever be able to stand before you. So whether you understand exactly what I'm saying or not, if you believe the truth of God's word without any reservation, I guarantee you, you could turn off sickness on the inside of you. But a person thinks, but I'm only human. See, that's a lie. You aren't only human. If you're born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, one third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. Amen. You have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. But people will approach God, oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. The doctor says it's incurable, but I believe you can do all things. Did you know that's all a lie? Somebody says, well, you, you, don't you believe God can do all things? No. God says... He will only do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that works in you. God has limited himself to working through people and you have to believe to receive or if you doubt, you do without. It's wrong to say, oh God, you could do anything. If you wanted to, you could just heal me. That's not true. See, you have believed a lie. God has to have a person to flow through. You have to believe in order to receive. So again, whether you totally followed me or not, I'm telling you, you cannot fail without first of all believing a lie that I'm only human. This is incurable. This is bigger than me. None of those things are true. One person with God is a majority. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If God's telling you to come here and you say, but I, I, I need this, I need money, I need whatever. And see, you're believing a lie. You believe that you have to wait until God removes all of the obstacles before you can obey. Man, if God says something to you, you just do it. You don't care what the results is. You just do it. This makes Christian life so simple. I don't have to sit here and debate it. God, am I going to obey you in this? <laughs> it's never a question with me. Now, again, sometimes I have to pray to make sure, is this really God or is this me? You know, when the Lord told me to 
Uh, we were building a building down in Colorado Springs and it was $3.2 million. And at that time, that was like a year's income. And, uh, and he told me to do it debt free. And at the rate we had saved money, I figured it out. It, I would have been over a hundred years old before I'd have gotten that thing done. And so I had to make sure, God, is this really you? Because this was a big decision. And if I said that I'm not going to go into debt and I do this debt free, and if it wasn't God and we just saved money at the rate we'd been going, it would have taken me 40 years or something to get it done. So it was a big decision. And I spent a few days praying until I was assured that it was God. But the moment I knew that this is what God told me to do, I went in and told the manager of our ministry, I said, I'm not taking out a loan. We'd been trying to get a loan for nine months and they just kept saying, no, wait. And then they said, let's start the whole process over. And I said, no way am I going to do that. And so when I, once I knew that the Lord told me to do it debt free, I went in and told the manager, I said, I don't care if they come to us tomorrow and, and offer us all of the $3.2 million dollars I'm not taking it. Guess what? The next day they came and said, you need $4 million. You have been approved. Here's your $4 million. And I told them, you're too late. Amen. And I turned down $4 million. And in 14 months, we had that $3.2 million and we moved into that facility debt free. But see, I, once I know it's God, I'm going to do it. I don't care regardless of whether it looks like it's going to bless me or help me or not. That's what the scripture means when it says in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Many of you are here seeking direction from the Lord. I'm telling you, one of the keys to that is just running up a white flag and surrendering. Like Carrie was saying today, getting to a place to where God, if you say no, that's fine. You aren't trying to get him to buy into what you want him to do. But you're saying, Father, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. And when you get to that place to where it's not about me, what do you want me to do? And the way you find out what he wants you to do is through the word of God. Uh, Carrie also used that verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 this morning, where it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. The way you find out is to get your mind renewed, transformed, and it's through the word of God that that happens. You have to get to where God's word just becomes absolute in your life. And if it violates our culture, let it violate our culture. If it violates the way that you've been raised, if it doesn't look like it's making sense to you, you just do what God tells you. And again, I could give, I could spend hours tonight giving you testimonies of when God told me to do something like give away all of my materials. Dwayne and I are the only two people I know. I've, I've heard some others since then, but for decades, Dwayne is the only other person I knew on the planet that gave his stuff away. I've given away hundreds of millions of books, CDs, DVDs, and this, that, this isn't including anything on the web. I remember when we started our website, they came and said, are you going to make the web, everything on the web free? You could make a lot of money. And I thought, I've given away hundreds of millions of CDs, cassettes, and stuff. I said, man, the web, I'm going to just keep doing it. We get millions of downloads every month. I'm not including any of that. I have given away hundreds of millions of books, CDs, DVDs, and materials to people. And when I first did that, everybody told me, you're crazy. I actually had Kenneth Copeland's mother, Vanetta. She was a friend of mine. And she came to me and prophesied one time, thus saith the Lord. Quit giving things away. <laughs> and she made it, thus saith the Lord. And I had to tell her, I said, Vanetta, I love you, but God told me to do this and I am not going to quit doing it. Did you know to the natural mind, that just makes no sense at all. And yet I believe it's one of the keys to God expanding our ministry. 
I have had hundreds, maybe thousands of people tell me the only reason I listened to you is because your stuff was free. <laughs> and that's what got them interested. And, and man, as a result, you know, we go, we're on television and uh, my media buyer, he handles over $44 million worth of television time per year for other ministries. And so we had a comparison through these other ministries. And I remember when I went on the church channel, they told me, they said, look, not, none of our people that we've put on the church channel have ever gotten over 10 to 12 calls in one day. That's the maximum. It's not going to turn a profit, but to be able to go on TBN, you have to be on the church channel first. And so I said, all right, I'll go on the church channel then. You know, we were getting two and 300 calls a day on the church channel while other people were getting 10. And a lot of it's because my stuff's free. <laughs> but you know what? Boy, once they get it and start listening to it, it has, we were prosper and we're blessed. I'm saying that God will tell you to do things that don't make sense to your mind, but God's smarter than you. <laughs> I know that's hard for some of you to believe. But God is smarter than you. And just like Carrie was saying this morning, if God tells you no, it's because what you were planning isn't his best. He's got something better for you. He'll never tell you no just to hurt you. And see, this is what Satan did. Hath God said, and she said, well, yes. But she, you could tell she was already entertaining the doubt. And finally, the devil just comes out and he says, you shall not surely die. First of all, he gets you to question the integrity of God's word. Is this really accurate? Is something that was written thousands of years ago still applicable to us today? And I guarantee you, our world today is coming against the standards of the word of God and challenging it. Evolution will challenge the first 11 chapters of the book of the Bible and say, this stuff is crazy. How could a fish swallow a person? They've actually found people inside a fish before. It's a scientific fact, but they will come out and they'll try and get you to challenge all of these things and just plant doubts. And then after you entertain the doubt, they'll just come out and say, that's not accurate. This doesn't apply for us today. I remember uh, uh, Bill Clinton and he was questioned because he claimed to be a Baptist. He claimed to be a born again Christian and yet he's the one that started the open uh, transgender, I mean, not transgender, but homosexuality in the uh, military. And he started violating all things. He pushed abortion and on and on. And one of the reporters one time asked him, says, how can you claiming to be a born again Christian do these things that are contrary to the Bible? And I heard him say this. He says, the Bible was written by men and it was apl applicable for their day, but you have to interpret in the light of our society. And basically you cannot go by what the Bible said. This applied to people back then, but those things don't apply to us today. Did you know there's entire denominations? There's lots of people. Raphael Warnock, the guy that was elected as a senator from Georgia, he's pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the church that Martin Luther used to pastor. And he is trying to use the Bible to say it is uh, abortion is correct. Homosexuality is correct. He's a reverend only in his own mind. I don't revere the guy. And he's trying to use the Bible. That's a total perversion because they believe that the Bible is moldable. You have to interpret it in the light of what our society is doing. You know what that is? That's idolatry. They're making God in their image. They're saying, God, here's the way I think.